Public affairs programming on WQPT is brought to you by the Singh Group at Merrill Lynch, serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years. Rethinking Moline's main drag, Hispanic businesses flexing their muscle, and helping some mothers fill a need for their newborns in the cities. The Greater Quad Cities Hispanic Chamber of Commerce has reached a milestone and isn't done yet. And helping mothers who cannot breastfeed, an innovative approach helping moms and infants. We'll talk about both of those topics in a moment. But first, what to do about the Avenue of the Cities. It's been a workhorse for the city of Moline, once becoming the city's real second main street. But times have changed. And now Moline wants to know how the Avenue can be best suited for the future. And joining us now are city planners uh, Ray Forsyth and Jeff Anderson. Thank you both for joining us. Thank You're you. Welcome. You're actually going to be testing the pulse of the people as far as Avenue of the Cities is concerned. Is it part of a master plan or what are you looking for? Yeah, I guess you could call it that. Technically, uh, we're calling it the Avenue of the Cities Corridor Plan, but really are drilling down to the level of a master plan like we've done downtown for the last two decades. Well, and look at what's happened downtown. I mean, your planning can become a reality is I guess what I'm trying to underline here. We'd like to use that as a good example. I think uh, the City Council agrees they've established this as a goal over the last couple of years. So we'll be, you know, kind of getting into the transportation, economic development, uh, nearby neighborhoods, and uh, just looking to the future. How difficult is it, Ray, to deal with something that's so established like Avenue of the Cities? Because it, it, it just becomes so narrow as a four-lane street, sidewalk building, older buildings, right. and infrastructure that has been renewed. Right, we've already done some streetscaping. It's a, it's a great opportunity because if you think about it, it's in the middle of Moline. So it's really good, solid neighborhoods. The high school's there, there's an elementary school there, alternative high school. We have major you know, destination shopping with the grocery stores. We have you know, national retailers, a lot of mom and pops. It's a great infrastructure. Now we're gonna do what we've done downtown and take it to Avenue of the Cities. And what would you like to see, Jeff? Because I mean, as Ray was pointing out, I mean, you've got a mix of everything. Because you think of the educational mm -hmm. campuses that are kind of in the heart there, but you also got a mix of residential and retail. Well, it's an interesting corridor, and obviously it's <laughs> served as a primary arterial in terms of transportation, so we want to maintain that and maybe even see if we can pump some more volume in there in order to drive more economic activity. There's some great neighborhoods adjacent to the corridor, and when you talk about uh, the corridor kind of getting narrow and how do you deal with that, uh, looking at one strategy that kind of flips that around, turns it into a positive, where we're hoping to get more kind of pedestrian oriented and use those adjacent neighborhoods to feed in the local stores and uh, drive activity in that manner. Because you do think of Avenue of the Cities as pretty much a traffic corridor. You don't, because mm -hmm. because you don't have parking on the street, you just have people basically going through it in a lot of cases. That, that's very much what it is. At the same time, if you <laughs> slow down a little bit, there really is a lot going on there uh, from the, the commercial business service side and the adjacent neighborhoods. And uh, we believe there's a lot to pull from in terms of kind of an asset-based approach to uh, uh, moving to the next step. You take a look, right, 30 years ago, that was a major shopping district. Right. I mean, Sears was there, Kings right. Plaza, of course, was there. It was always the Target main... Target was there, yeah. That's right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Then it was the main drag, of course, over so, so many years right. for Moline High School kids. Right. It has really evolved, but it still has kind of its own pulse. Right, it does, because it has a kind of a mixture of new suburban-type construction with high V, the new Aldi store. So you've got some interesting dynamics there because you have the, the 50s and 60s style retail which is right on the street built up right to the curb almost but huge opportunities because you've got such great traffic in the neighborhoods it's walkable it's drivable really good public transportation up there i think it's metrolink's number one route so jeff what do you want to see what what, what input can the public have well, that's what we'd like to hear from the public. You know, the, the avenue isn't just one homogenous strip. It really does kind of break down into separate zones. We'd like to dig into that a little bit more and hear from the people who live there, work there, drive through there, and kind of get their impressions. I'd like to share some ideas with them as well. 
Um, you know, there are some fascinating things happening uh, across society in terms of transportation, mm -hmm. which the, the avenue serves a, a function, and uh, whether it's autonomous vehicles, uh, transit expanding, um, those sorts of things. And then also retail restructuring. You know, there, there's a, you know maybe a not so good side, but there's some very I think upside opportunities to capturing where things are going in the next decade or two. So see some real opportunity in that regard. Jeff was pointing out how you're kind of using downtown as kind of a blueprint, or right. at least an I can do this because we've done it. Right. But downtown's hardly done. Um, I mean, oh, right. Just the changes of I-74 bridge is really right. showing what Moline can still do. Right. And we have huge opportunities with the the land under the existing bridge when it goes away. We have about six blocks of infrastructure that's there, the streets, the utilities, the, you know, the people are there. So now we have new construction opportunities. We talked a little bit about um, the Spiegel building. We're saving that building. It's going to be a historic renovation. We still are getting infill projects on some of the vacant space downtown. I think we have three new restaurants that are going to open by the end of the year. Um, a lot of really good opportunities downtown and people are now speculating on the traffic coming off the bridge and we're starting to fill our retail spaces and you know now that we're looking at new construction. One of the things that the cities have really learned is that they really want people living downtown because it exactly. adds a vibrancy. We've seen that in Rock Island, we've seen it in Davenport right. and for a period of time I know Moline had 100 percent occupancy I right. believe as far as its downtown uh, residents are concerned. Is it still that way? It's still and, is, and so there's still a big need. Right, we, we're talking to the Heart of America group about 155 market rate apartments, new construction. We've still got some renovations going on where the first floor is retail, the upper floors are residential. And then I think in the new plan, what we're working on with the Lakota group under the I-74 bridge, we'll see a mix of office retail and definitely residential new construction. And the key also that we see over and over again, because you, 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 we turned our back in the 70s and 80s to right. old buildings. Wow, what a difference it's made right. in this century. It definitely, definitely. People want to live in that, you know, the historic building, but it has all the new amenities. So the developers know what they're doing. The, the Chase building is a really good example. Russell Construction and the Amin Group came in and did 31 market rate apartments. They're 100% full. Well, and Jeff, once again, we're, we're talking about how the people can get involved in things like this. And you think of downtown, you think of the Avenue of the Cities. So you can even talk about John Deere Road. Uh, the planning involved in those three stretches of road uh, really hopefully does pay off in the months ahead. I think it has to. Uh, transportation is a fundamental driver of economic activity and whether we're you know rolling around in autonomous vehicles or pedaling our bicycles uh -huh. people have to move from point A to point B. And so how is John Deere Road going to be more of a 21st century route? Well I think just being able to accommodate the traffic keeping the level of service up so that people can make use of it and uh, don't go uh, to another alternative. That uh, we're, in a sense, inviting people into the community and to interact within that area. And I think the other advantage of that, too, is the old John Deere Road had no crosswalks. There was literally no way to get from the north to the south side of John Deere Road. Right. All of the intersections now have crosswalks, so people are going to be able to get from the north to the south and vice versa. So it's being able to be more you know, customer service friendly and pedestrian friendly. You know, we're, we have a grant um, to expand the bike path from, from the Rock River to the Mississippi River, which is going to run right through the heart of that. So how key is it as far as the future for John Deere Road then? Because when you thought of John Deere Road 10 years ago, that's where all the box stores are going to go. Right. And now retail isn't that. So is it, have you rethought what the future of John Deere Road is going to well, be? Well, what's interesting is the developers are finding really what I would think would be awkward pieces of property and fitting <laughs> in retail. You know, they just built the Starbucks on the Unity Point campus. Right. And, and who would have thought that they were ever going to build retail on a campus of a hospital, but, but Starbucks saw a huge demand with the population base and then also the traffic that goes in and out of there. Um, the Panda Express that opened up, they fit that in property that they assembled from three different property owners. Well, no, no one ever thought the theater would work there either. Right, exactly. Think and, about it. And, and so we're seeing that, and now we're seeing that on, on Avenue of the Cities. There's a new Starbucks that's under construction, and they literally are building it on a parking lot. And if you think about these old big boxes had all kinds of parking, and today you, it's less you know, less parking demand. So they're building a Starbucks right on Avenue of the Cities. We need more Starbucks. Right, right we do. <laughs> Ray Forsyth, Jeff Anderson, thank you so much for joining us. Moline, it's, it's, it's fun to be in your job today, but mind you, it's, it's all the years of planning we didn't see right. that really is, is making today successful. So well, thank thanks you for, for your interest, us. Jim. We appreciate it. In a moment, supporting minority business owners and more thanks to the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. But first, here's Laura Adams, out and about. 
This is Out and About for October 22nd through 28th. Hi, I'm Laura Adams. Get out your running shoes because it's time for the Quad Cities Halloween Classic, Lago Marcino's Coco Bino 5K in the village of East Davenport on the 27th. Or join Hogtoberfest, the annual fundraiser for Friendly House held October 25th at the River Center, featuring unlimited pork, beer, and seasonal specialty drink samples. Join the Rock Island Paranormal Investigative Team as they conduct a full, in-depth investigation of the Hallberg Mansion on October 27th. Plus, the QC Haunted Forest is open weekends in October in Port Byron. The new Putnam Museum exhibit, Literary Heroines, Their Times, Their Fashions, runs through January 6th, and the French Modern's Manet to Matisse exhibit continues at the Figgy Art Museum. The Rocky Horror Show, featuring that sweet transvestite, is on stage at the Circa 21 Speakeasy, while on the main stage is the comedy Mama Won't Fly. The Augustana Choir and Augustana Choral Artists perform at First Lutheran Church in Moline on October 26th, while the United States Marine Band perform at the Adler Theater October March 25th. Music at the Butterworth present the Gaudette Brass Quintet at the Butterworth Center October 25th, and Quad City Flutes Unlimited present their fall concert, Flutes in the Forest, at the Benedictine Sisters of St. Mary Monastery in Rock Island on the 28th. For more information, visit wqpt.org. Thank you, Laura. It was in October of 2008 when Quad City businessman Bob Ontiveros decided to do more for Hispanic businesses that were trying to flourish in the Quad Cities. He helped create the Greater Quad Cities Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. It's now marking its first decade and is coming off a year where it was nationally recognized. It also has a new leader. Joining us is the Executive Director, Zenaida Alenderos. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Happy 10th anniversary. Thank you. It really is an accomplishment. I mean, um, you're the new Executive Director, but you've been associated with the Chamber for a while, so you've really seen it grown. How proud of you? How proud are you of that? It's pretty amazing to yeah. have been able to be a part of the growth of the Hispanic Chamber. Um, we've been through a lot, and we're excited to celebrate all of the accomplishments that we've had in these, in these past 10 years. Um, so it's a very exciting time for the Hispanic Chamber and for our community. And we couldn't be more proud to celebrate our 10 year anniversary along with the award, the national recognition that we received. Let's talk about the national recognition. I mean, that's pretty good uh, to be named the best small chamber of the year for 2018. Yes, yeah, so this award was, um, is presented by the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and they have almost, um, 200 chamber members that are part of this organization and out of those 200 chamber members the the greater quad cities hispanic chamber of commerce was chosen to be their chamber of the year in the category of small so we're very proud of that and i think a lot of that has to do with the programs and the partnerships that we've been able to establish here in the quad cities and it's it's very exciting. Because it's important to point out that you have a focus on Hispanic businesses, but not exclusive to Hispanic businesses. Explain that. Exactly. So the Hispanic Chamber, we've been growing a lot um, through the programs and the services that we offer. But I think one of the things that people don't realize is that these services are not only for Hispanic businesses, but we also welcome businesses of any background to join the Hispanic Chamber because we are a connection to the Latino market. And that's one of the most, I think, unique things and the strongest qualities of our Hispanic Chamber is that we're able to be inclusive and we are multicultural. So we, we welcome anybody to, to join the Hispanic Chamber and to use the resources that are available for our entire community. Well, an, an association that involves Hispanic businesses kind of does underline how those businesses are thriving and the fact that you can give support so that they can actually grow. I mean, it, it is kind of interesting to see that sector of the business world doing much better. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and I think one of the reasons that um, a lot of businesses and organizations reach out to us is because they would like to become more inclusive and they would like to tap into the Latino market. And the Hispanic Chamber has played an important role in not only our Quad Cities communities, but um, for businesses and organizations that want to make sure that they are doing this in the most respectful, respectful and effective way um, for their businesses. So it, it's something that we are proud to be a part of and we are proud to um, offer that service to our community. Tell me about some of the specific services. If I'm mm -hmm. a small business person, 
money is tight and I'm not quite sure if I should join an organization or if I'm going to get my money's worth. I mean, what do you offer, especially to the small business person? So I think one of the, the, the best things that we offer are the networking opportunities. Um, it's very difficult when you're starting a business um, to actually reach out and market your, your business if you're maybe the one person that's staffed um, for your, your business. So being able to have a space to promote your business, mm -hmm. that's exactly what the Hispanic Chamber is about. We're here to promote and support um, all of your business goals. And um, if we can't say help you with one specific service, we, we do have referral partners and we are able to refer you to a special um, service that you may require. So um, that's what the Hispanic Chamber is, is proud to offer, not only that network, um, but the resources and the referral partners. To In a way, with. almost a safety net too, for some of these business people that may have no other area of expertise to turn to. Yes, I. Um, so one of the, the most, um, I think uh, exciting things is for me um, in the Hispanic Chamber is to be able to be a part of businesses that are growing. Um, we've been able to see businesses that start with one store and have grown mm -hmm. to two or three. And just being able to be a part of that process of, of growing and to help them you know, reach out to certain partners or connect them with certain members of the community to help them grow, that's something that, that we are proud to to be a part of. Well, and as we said at the beginning, one of the driving forces really was Bob Andaveras. Still very active, I know that. How mm -hmm. important is it to have a person like that as a driving force in the community to help not only the Hispanic businesses, but other businesses as well? Sure, I think, I think we're very proud and very um, privileged to have somebody in our community like Bob that has not only founded the Hispanic Chamber, but he has seen the benefits of being part of a chamber um, when he was doing business across the nation. So he was able to give back and create that environment here for our community. We are actually the only Hispanic chamber um, from between sh the Chicago area and Omaha, Nebraska. So that means we're also the only Hispanic chamber in the entire state of Iowa. So that's very unique that the Quad Cities is home to a Hispanic chamber. And that just shows you the type of, the type of community that we are. Mm -hmm. We're a very inclusive community and we're very proud of that. Zenaya Landeras, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Happy 10th anniversary and good luck with the new position as executive director. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. In a moment, banking on breast milk, an innovative Quad City program to help mothers with newborns. But first, our artist profile features a St. Ambrose University theology professor who's just as comfortable on stage as he is in the classroom. Here's Keith Soko with Jet Black Hair. Jet black hair on a body like that She's the kind of woman stop me in my tracks I said, jet black hair on a body like that She's the kind of woman with a bike out back I don't know what I need to know You just lead and that's where I'll go Jet black hair on a body like that She's a leather lover, got stiletto tracks, I said. Jet black hair on a body like that. She looks just like Xena, warrior princess. I don't know what I need to know. You just lead and that's where I'll go. I want that motorcycle, baby, all night long. Motorcycle, baby. All night long I want that motorcycle, baby All night long I said Jet black hair on a body like that She's the kind of woman stop me in my tracks I said Jet black hair on a body like that She's the kind of woman with a bike out back I said Jet black hair on a body like that Jet black hair on a body like that I said yeah I said yeah I 
Keith Soko, jet black hair. New mothers have plenty of things to worry about. They shouldn't need to worry about feeding their babies. The Rock Island County Health Department is trying to solve the problem for some of these mothers who can't breastfeed by opening a human milk depot. And joining us is Rock Island County Health Department Chief Operating Officer Janet Hill. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. We were talking that this has been almost a year in the works. How did this start? I met Summer Kelly, who is the executive director of the Mother's Milk Bank of the Western Great Lakes, which is based near O'Hare Airport in Chicago. And she talked about how there was not a milk depot or drop-off site in all of northwestern Illinois. Moms who wanted to drop off their donated breast milk had to go to Peoria, Rockford, and then fairly recently one opened in Monmouth, Illinois. And, and, and what is it used for? I mean, the, the, the people that are allowed access to the milk is often what? Children in, in neonatal care? Exactly. Um, Preterm babies are especially susceptible to disease and breast milk is an antidote. Breast milk is the perfect food for babies. And, and, and we were talking about how long does this last? I mean, how, uh, how does the system work? Well, it, it works similar to a blood bank. Okay. The only difference is that you don't have to go to the depot to make your donation. You can pump in the privacy of your own home and then bring the the uh, donated breast milk in food grade containers uh, using safe food handling practices, just like you would in your own kitchen. And bring it to the depot and then we will put it in a deep freeze and then when we get enough, we will ship it with dry ice up to the milk bank near O'Hare. Well, it makes you wonder, is it tested? I mean, how do you know that it's safe? How do you know that it's pure? Well, that is one of the main reasons why we got involved in this. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of informal milk sharing um, networks in this community. And as health officials, we find that very scary mm. because um, breast milk is a bodily fluid and we don't know exactly what is in it. Um, so the milk bank uh, not only screens its donors, but it also tests the milk twice before it's sent to the hospitals. Now, we were talking about it being used in, in neonatal care, which would mean it's being given in a hospital setting, but that's not exclusive, is it? That is generally the most common. However, um, Summer Kelly was here in the Quad Cities this, just this week, and she talked about how they have such an excess of milk banks because moms have really, or uh, milk, of donated milk because moms have really taken to this, that they could work out with a deal with individual mothers. Well, and as you were mentioning, I mean, the, the fact that uh, uh, mother's milk has so many uh, positive influences on such a small child that will impact for the rest of the life. Absolutely. There's really, there are substitutes, but not necessarily good. I mean, why, why is that? Because uh, um, breast milk provides um, immunity. It provides, um, it is easily digested by babies. And that's one of the main reasons why it's the best for preterm babies because their digestive systems are so immature and they, they can't really tolerate formula. Mm -hmm. And they can tolerate breast milk because it is the, the milk that babies are sp uh, supposed to drink. Well, and it builds the human tolerance to so many different diseases right. as well as uh, uh, all different types of things that can impact a child. Right. Let me talk about also if, if you're interested in donating. Um, like you said, there, there are some informal banks or informal uh, uh, exchanges going on. You would like to see it done more safely. So how does somebody get involved? They can call any of our WIC clinics in Rock Island County. That's in Rock Island. Uh, then we have a, a long-standing partnership with CHC. So we have a clinic in Moline and one day a week on Monday in East Moline. So if they want to call any of our um, WIC professionals and we could um, send them to the donor uh, interest form on the Mother's Milk Bank of the Western Great Lakes website. Um, we can answer their questions and then once they uh, go through a screening process, it involves some blood tests and other some health screening questions. It takes about two to three weeks and then once they receive a donor number, they are welcome to drop off their donation to us at the Moline WIC site at CHC. Right, and if you have any questions, just contact the health department. You've got the professionals there that can answer. Right. Let me move on to one other topic, because of course, cold and flu season. That's We're right. And I have to always ask you these questions <laughs> when you're here. You're really pushing flu shots once again this year, because last year was such a tough year. That's right. Um, flu shots um, are very important, and generally you want to get them done early in the season. And October is the prime month for um, getting your flu shot. At the health department, we have um, 
clinics every day and we have a walk-in clinic on Tuesday. So you can come between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. and we'll get you taken care of. And once again, I mean, who do you recommend most strongly to receive a flu shot? Well, we recommend everyone get it. Um, but especially seniors and children. Their immunity, their immune systems are not quite as strong as middle-aged folks um, and they are more susceptible to the illness. We've talked about how bad last year's flu season was. Yes. It, it hit uh, certain sectors of the population devastatingly hard. And, and also it, it seems to last, I know I'm saying this and it's probably <laughs> not true, it's medically not true, sometimes it seems like it's lasting longer than it has in the past. Well, if anyone has ever had the flu, they know just how horrible it is. And if you can do anything to prevent getting sick, I don't know why you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as you said, there's also free opportunities to get the uh, shots as well. That's right. Um, through the health department, we offer sliding scales. Um, we also take um, pretty much every insurance, um, the Illinois Medicaid. Um, and if you have no insurance and just can't afford it, we do have a sliding fee scale. And once again, contact your local county health department. You get so much more information. That's right. All right, Janet Hill, thank you so much for joining us. You're we welcome. do appreciate it. WQPT is also marking a milestone starting this month. It's our 35th anniversary on the air as the Quad Cities Public Television Station. And we invite you to share in the start of our celebration. We're offering a free public screening of the new program, 35 Years of WQPT, a retrospective. We're showing it this Thursday at 5 at the Western Illinois University Quad Cities Riverfront Hall. It looks back at almost four full decades of local programming and educational outreach. So we'll hope you'll join us this Thursday at 5 on the air, on the radio, and on the web, as well as your mobile device. Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Public Affairs programming on WQPT is brought to you by the Singh Group at Merrill Lynch, serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years.